I am yammering now, so it should be it should be working. Uh, it was made before it was put together based on the plans of how to put it together. We, in fact, did not do it exactly this way. It's about ten billion, five to ten billion to build the the whole thing, and each experiment is about half a billion dollars, Swiss francs, euros. It's all kind of at this level, it's about the same. Those are the papers I'm going to go through. I had something to do with all of them. There's no paper on Atlas I had nothing to do with. Oh, these are Atlas papers. Yes. <laughs> this is what I thought you invited me to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't propose it. So anyway, so, so come. All right, so I'm, first, can you all hear me? Second, I have terrible blackboard skills, so if you can't see something, I, I, I learned at Northwestern where you, you lecture with your chalk in one hand and the eraser in the other, and you just kind of make this little parade. Uh, so stop me if you didn't understand anything or you can't see something or anything. I don't really care how much material I go through. I want you to understand some of it rather than to see how much how many slides I can show. This is going to be mostly Blackboard. Uh, we'll see how, how that goes. That's where I thought they were going to send me. We're going to talk about three papers. And what I thought the most useful thing to do, so let me back up. What I thought would be not terribly useful was to spend the first day talking about all the technical aspects of being an experimenter and put you to sleep, and then go on and talk about actual analyses, because then you wouldn't remember the important parts of, of the technical bits. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through three analyses. Uh, this one, number one, is the Chi-B3P discovery. Uh, number B is the Higgs discovery. 
And Roman numeral three is a long-lived Gluino search, which is kind of a weird thing, which is, I'm going to try and show you that these experiments can do things a little bit beyond the sort of straightforward things that, that you know, leptons, jets, missing ET, and so on. Uh, and those are the archive numbers if you want to follow it. So let's start with a Kybe 3P. Uh, if I say triplet S1, does everyone know what I'm talking about? Didn't think so. OK. I was the last generation to learn spectroscopy in graduate school. So triplet S1 means I'm talking about a state. S is the L here, so it uh, has angular momentum 0. Triplet means it has spin 1. And then 1 plus 0 is 1. So let's start with the charmonium spectrum. I have the J psi here, which is a triplet S1. And it's partner the A to C, which is singlet S0. Up here, there are radial excitations of these guys. And over here, we have three chi states, triplet P, 0, 1, and 2. And these are all CC bar. So that got a Nobel Prize. The rest of this was sorting out the details. OK, so that's what it looks like with charm. What's it going to look like with bottom? Almost exactly the same. A couple of differences. One is bottom is heavier, so it's bound deeper. It's moving slower. Also, these hyperfine splittings are going to be smaller because the mass of the B is different. I'm going to draw the hyperfine the same, um, at the same level, but if I were really doing this for real life, you'd, you'd shrink it by a factor of three. So in the bottom, that's supposed to be an epsilon, not an eta. That's BB bar threshold. So well, you've got two guys there. You have three here. You'll get P states as well. I'm running out of chalk. So I have these three P states, and they're called 1P, 2P, and what we discovered was the 3P. OK, let's go back here. If I produce a chi state, what happens to it? It decays. What does it decay to? It does decay to pions. But it turns out that 10, 20 percent of the time, depending on which one, it'll make a radiative transition down. So it'll make a photon. This is an E1 transition for those of you who remember Jackson. It's actually it's an E1 transition even if you don't remember Jackson. <laughs> right? So that's what happens here. There's also, a, by the way, there's a singlet P state that decays down to the, uh, the singlet S. But we're not going to worry about that. So here, the same thing happens. But you can also have that. So, so basically, any P state can decay to an S state. That's the basic idea behind these. All right, I'm going to leave these up. All right, so say we wanted to go looking for one of these guys. What does my detector need to do? What do what I need to detect? I need to detect a photon. And I need to detect the J psi or the epsilon. Turns out these have branching fractions to two muons of 6% and 2% respectively. We like muons. Muons are good. They're easy to spot. So we need. J psi, epsilon, essentially two muons. Right, and how do we identify a muon? Essentially, we look at a charged particle track that's highly penetrating, which gets us into tracking. So 
This is Colorado, as Andre would draw it. Particle is there. I'm going to draw two particles. Which one of these had, has more momentum, the left or the right? Left. Why? Straight. It's not bent in the magnetic field. The thing we measure is this thing called the sagitta. It's Latin for arrow. Sagittarius, the archer, means arrow guy in Latin. And what you'll find is that this is equal to QBL squared over 8PT. This is for a magnetic field that's going this way, the same as the beam. Right. You can sort of see how this, this might work out. Right. I, have, I have one L to say how much it's, you know, to set the scale. I've got another one which says how much bending I've got. I need this to be a square. And the more PT I have, the straighter the track is. You can then turn this around and say PT is going to be equal to, I should have made this bigger. over 8s. So again, the smaller the sagitta, the more the PT of the track. So let's look at this for a second. I've got this BL squared term in here. All right, so what is that going to what is that telling me? That tells me all other things being equal, I would like to have more lever arm than I would have more magnetic field. Right? One way to look at this is one of those Ls tells you how many measurements you have, the other L tells you how much it's bending. Right, that's sort of the way to remember which, which one gets the square. The other thing to take a look at the to take a look, delta PT over PT goes as one over S, which is proportional to PT. So that means the uncertainty on the momentum of the track is proportional to the momentum of that track. Right? So that means as I go to higher and higher energies, tracking gets worse and worse. Right, and that's going to be important later when we talk about things like the nematron. <laughs> when you go to 100 TeV, the ex one of the experimental challenges is how you're going to deal with this. So this is how we're going to identify tracks and how we're going to measure them. This is a picture of a tracker in real life. This is the silicon detector. Uh, you can sort of see the size of it because they left their tools on the bench. So this is something which is you know, a microwave oven or so, rough, roughly that, that big, maybe a little bit bigger. This is it going into the rest of the tracker. You can tell it's Europe because there's somebody talking on their cell phone. This is all Atlas. Uh, is this being recorded? This is all experiment A, a hypothetical LHC experiment that in many ways is better than experiment C, another <laughs> hypothetical LHC experiment. So that's the whole detector. You can sort of see a person behind this. It's a, the whole inner detector is about the size of a Fiat 500. OK, so turn that off for a second. So there are several different technologies that we can use for this. You sort of saw as it built up. In the inner region, we like to use silicon because silicon is very, very precise. Essentially what this is, by the way, when was the last time you guys had a lab, lab glass? Like two years ago, three years ago? All of you hated it? <laughs> is, is there anyone who, anyone who took it recently and loved it? OK, I've got, <laughs> I've, I've got my audience nailed here. <laughs> Basically, a silicon detector is nothing more than a reverse bias diode. No, no current is flowing through. A charged particle goes through, and it screws that up by, by ionizing. Right? So now current flows for a bit until it reestablishes itself. That's all we do. We stick an atlas. We have them all in the middle. CMS has them spread everywhere. Right? Also, uh, we use on the outside, we use gas tubes filled with xenon. Particle goes through, ionizes it, and we drift it to a wire and measure it that way. The silicon we like because it is faster and it is more precise. It is also much more expensive. So you can't build the whole experiment out of silicon, at least not in the first go. All right. Pattern recognition, though, is a key to this. So oh, I'm already running out of space. 
So let's say, let's forget the collider geometry and say, I just want to determine where a line is. How many points do I need? I just drew them. Everyone should know that. How many <laughs> points do I need to determine a line? Two. So if all I wanted to do was measure one line, how many detectors would I need? Two. The problem comes in, so I've got my line. Suppose I have two particles that I'm going through and I only have my two detectors. Now I don't know whether this is what happened or if that's what happened. Because all I see are these four hits. All right, so we call that pattern recognition. So a helix has five parameters, so how many points do we need? <laughs> see, you guys are right on top of it. You need, you need you need five to come up with a helix. Well, look, position. How many numbers do you need to define a position? Three. We're working in three. We're working in three plus one dimensions. <laughs> right. The metric has traced two, not four. Two as God intended. <laughs> so, you have three to determine the position. How many do you need to determine the direction? Three more, but I don't care where on that trajectory it is for the helix, so that subtracts one. So there's five degrees of freedom. I need five numbers to determine a helix. But you now see if I have two particles going through, I'm not going to be able to get the helix with just five. So what we do is we have many, 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 many measurements so we can play connect the dots and tell that we had two tracks that went like this in a way that this sort of geometry doesn't let you do this. Now, to give you an example of how, this, how easy this is to screw up, I drew this over here. So here's what you might get if you had a particle and a, a set of tracking planes here, and the ovals are where the hits are. And you say, okay, I can kind of line things up pretty well. I have a little bit of trouble up there where things are dense and you know, I missed a hit here, but mostly I get it right. But if I turn one hit off, instead of saying that I see four or five particles that are all coming from the primary vertex, here, by dropping just one hit, it fits better to having four tracks that come from a secondary vertex. So in this case, there's two possible ways of interpreting what we see. And dropping just one hit causes you to decide that you'd rather go with number two rather than number one. So you have two ways of solving this problem. Way one is you make sure that your tracking is always perfectly efficient. This is difficult. The second way is redundancy. You have to have more and more and more tracks so that it turns out that you've got a lot of separation power between one track and two tracks, or two tracks next to each other. Do they cross? Do they not cross? Do they come from the same point? And so on. So typically, so Atlas has four pixel measurements very close to the beam pipe, followed by six strip measurements farther out, followed by 30 gas measurements. So typically, we have 40 or so hits on a track. And that helps us separate the case where you know, you've, you've somehow bobbled the pattern recognition. This will show up a little bit more in the third lecture. So that's tracking. So that's how we deal with the muons. The next issue is calorimetry. I have a photon. I want to measure its energy. What, what can I do to it? I can't measure it in a magnetic field. I have to stop it. Hence the word calorimeter. If you didn't like calorimetry in high school, you'll like this even less. So here is a typical calorimeter, Japan-shaped. <laughs> We'll say that it's made out of lead. And OK, I need some audience participation here. What's coming into it, a photon or an electron? Photon. So a photon goes through, hits a, hits a lead nucleus there, and it converts to an electron-positron pair. Now, what, what does the electron do? It, it bounces off something else, and then Bremster lungs and gives you another photon. What do these photons do? They convert to more pairs. So eventually I have a shower in here. Now, all these little tiny electron tracks are ionizing. So 
if I could, let's pretend we're doing this as a real calorimeter, I stick a thermometer in that, and I can tell how much energy has gone through this by how much this block of lead is warmed up. We don't do this way, why? Because it's stupid. But why is it stupid? Because it's slow and not very accurate because I'm trying to measure a very small amount of energy. So we have two ways of solving this problem. CMS says, well, let's make the lead transparent. If only we had transparent lead, our problem would be solved. Because if we had transparent lead, I would have Cherenkov radiation coming from the uh, from all these electrons, which are moving faster than the speed of light in the medium. The amount of Cherenkov radiation I get is proportional to the length of all of the tracks that I've produced. And the length of all of the tracks that I've produced is proportional to the energy that came in. And they also said, let's, let's go one better. Let's take a material that's not just transparent lead, but that scintillates when ionized by an electron or a positron. Now I'm making even more light, so I'm getting a better measurement of what's coming in there. So since I am essentially me counting the, measuring the light, I'm counting the number of photons, right? So delta E over E is going to be proportional to delta N over N, which is proportional to N. I'm sorry, that's proportional to root N. Mm -hmm which is proportional to root e. So while tracking gets worse and worse, calorimetry gets better and better. So again, when you start thinking about the nematron, this is one of those things you need to keep in mind. So let me show you pictures of how these things look like in real life. So CMS uses lead tungstate, which is essentially transparent lead and tungsten. There's a little oxygen to hold the whole thing together. Those numbers that you see, 16, 22, and 26, are radiation lengths. One radiation length means that a photon or an electron has a 1 over E probability of interacting. So if it's 26 radiation lengths, the probability is 100% that things interact. What you're seeing here is, above that, are previous technologies. So L3 used bismuth, bismuth germanium oxide. Uh, you can see that it's not as dense. And Babar used cesium iodide, which is even, even less dense, too. So CMS said, we'd like to use these lead tungstate crystals. And they decided what they wanted to do was to get absolutely, oh, I'd rather point. OK, fine. See, if I have one of these in my hands, I, I have a tendency to spend too much time on the slides. Anyway, CMS decided to go this route because they thought that the most important, th I'm sorry, experiment C thought that the most important thing is going to be energy resolution around the Higgs. So they designed their experiment to focus on that. And you can see you've got this delta E over E is proportional to, to root E. I have this wrong again. All right. So that's what CMS did. Atlas said, oh, this is, this is not the way we want to do this. Oh, by the way, so CMS has an incredibly large number of crystals all pointing back to the interaction point. So a photon that's produced here at the interaction point goes aligned perfectly. So CMS has thousands of crystals, and they're all different. Every one is a slightly different shape, so that you can plug it in in this puzzle, and every last one of them points at the, at the interaction. That, that was pretty impressive. Atlas decided to go a completely different route. So instead of going with transparent lead, Atlas said, let's break up our lead and stick something which is purport that has a response proportional to the number of particles that pass it. So Atlas uses liquid argon. So we measure the ionization in the liquid argon between layers of lead. This is called a sampling calorimeter. All other things being equal, which do you think would work better, a sampling calorimeter or a full containment calorimeter? Why? Answer was sampling calorimeter. Why? Because you see a lot of them, and there must be a good reason. I am part of Atlas, and I do think it's better, but this is, in fact, not why it's better. All other things being equal, sampling calorimeters are worse. 
because most of the energy goes into the, the radiator, the lead, and not so much into the argon that you're measuring. So my N goes down. Now, what are the advantages? I don't have to use transparent lead. I can use regular, ordinary old lead. That's, that's a big advantage. It's much, much cheaper. And you get almost as good resolution at the end of the day. So this is what it looks like. Fine, I'll use the damn pointer. It sits, that's a picture of Atlas. Those are people. This is the new picture. The old ones had people up there, which is a safety violation. <laughs> so the calorimeter is the size, I wouldn't say a house, maybe more like a cabin. Uh, it sits in three pieces because we could, it, you have to get it in somehow. And this is what it looks like. So you see these waves here? The waves are all lead. And there's many different layers in here. That's the other advantage of a sampling calorimeter. I can see in a sampling calorimeter how the shower develops. Whereas in a single full containment calorimeter, I get one number. So Atlas can tell whether the shower looks electromagnetic by how it, how it develops. And that helps us get rid of background. So CMS said the thing that's most important is to get the best energy resolution possible. Atlas said the thing that we want to do more, better than anything else is to reject background. Atlas is also has a tracking volume that's twice as big as CMS's, twice as long. Why did we do that? Because it lets the particles spread out more so that when we see them, we've got a clearer picture of what's connected to what. We have less confusion there. So that was what was going through our mind. Yes? The liquid argon in this picture is, the whole thing is immersed in liquid argon. And that's the next slide, which means I'm not going fast enough. That's what it looks like in real life. It's sitting inside a, a cryostat, or we'll soon be sitting inside of a cryostat, and the whole thing just sits immersed in liquid argon. Turns out you can't pour liquid argon into this. We tried. When you pour liquid argon, it stirs up crud in the bottom. And that's the technical term, crud. We don't know exactly what it is, but it was causing shorts. So instead, what we had to do was condense it in. We blew in cold liquid argon and let it condense on the, on the plates. Now it's sitting inside of a cryostat, so nobody can see anything that looks cool. And let me go a little bit more into photons. So this event has two photons in it. This guy over here, this is energy in the calorimeter, so you can see the energies here and here. Right? And this guy was an unconverted photon. There's no track pointing straight at it. There's these tracks nearby. And if you look in, you can see the shower develop. You see the shower develop in layers, the innermost, the middle, and the outermost. That's sort of telling us how the shower is developing. If there was too much energy here or too much energy there, we think it was a hadron. So it looks like a photon. This is the case where you have a conversion. You can see a lot of energy by the stiff guy, not so much energy by the soft guy. And if this is a flat enough uh, slide, you can see that these have opposite curvatures. If the screen has a little bit of twist to it, you can't. So that's a conversion. All right, let's get back to the measurement we wanted to do. This is very low energy, right? right we're talking about particles, you know, BB bar. We're not talking about Higgs's or W's or anything. So since it's low energy, we want to, when we look at conversions, unlike every other measurement in Atlas, we use the tracking to get us the conversions. As you go lower in energy, tracking gets better and better and better. Calorimetry gets worse and worse. So we've decided to use the tracking. So we're essentially looking for one of two signatures, two muons and a photon, or two muons and an electron-positron pair that came from a photon, like that guy over there. So at the end of the day, when you put them together, this is what you see. So this is what you're looking at is the reconstructed parent mass. This case here is where you have the transition from the chi 1p to the 1s, that is the epsilon, the 2p to the 1s, and then this guy showed up as the surprise. So some history. Let's just hope that no one actually looks at the recording. So the story behind this was a professor gave its uh, had his grad student say, let's look at the chi analysis and repeat it for the epsilon. And this will give you an opportunity to learn Atlas code. And when you've got two peaks, come back to me. And the grad student came back after a week and said, you said two peaks? How sure are you that there are two peaks? And that guy showed up right there. So this is with unconverted photons. The photon is just a plain old photon measured in the calorimeter. This is with converted photons. And you can see a couple of things. So. First of all, you see three peaks in the same spot. 
So if you think you've got some sort of technological problem with your detector, well, this is using the calorimeter and this is using only the tracker. So how can a problem manifest itself at the same place in two different spots? Also, with the converted photons, we can look at the 3P to 2S transition. So that guy here to that guy there. This is much softer, but you can see if we look at the parent mass, you've also got a bump over there. So we see the same thing in three channels. So we were fairly sure this is real. Now I'm going to say bad things about statistics. Yes. Right. There are nine lines there. That's right. There are nine lines there. Well, there's six lines there. It turns out the 3P0 has a, a negligible branching fraction into photons because it can decay straight to two gluons. So these things fall apart to five pions, or I'm sorry, it's CP even. They fall apart to four pions, and, and that's that. The other two, though, can decay. And yes, you're right. We have many different transitions that are there. Our resolution is nowhere near good enough to separate them. So these. Right. So, so for those of you, where this was uh, a technical discussion of branching fractions and on how they go. Uh, so the sep the separation is tens of MeV at the for the charmonium state. So there are a few for the bottom onium state, because it'll fall down by a factor of, of m. All right, so, and you can see this is 200 MeV there. So it's dominated completely by the detector resolution. Remember, we built this thing to find the Higgs. We did not build this to do charmonium spectro or quarkonium spectroscopy. That was just a bonus. So does anyone not believe those? Does anybody care how many sigmas they are? OK. so. It turns out we, we did this a couple of different ways. Uh, it goes anywhere between 7 and 14. Now, you might say, gosh, you're supposed to be an experimenter. You can't tell 7 from 14 sigma? And the answer is, no, we can't. Because 7 is incredibly unlikely, and 14 is incredibly unlikely. In fact, 14 is so unlikely, it is more probable that a cosmic ray went through the CPU that calculated the significance and got the wrong answer <laughs> than it was actually 14 sigma. <laughs> right. So I will tell you what the 7 sigma looked like, though, because it was kind of interesting. So. Seven Sigma said it was trying to fit it like that. Right? And the reason it went right through the peak. And the reason is it would be 14 Sigma if, I, if it pushed this down to the true background. And that's so incredibly unlikely. It would rather have a Seven Sigma downward dip and a Seven Sigma upward dip than to actually have a 14 Sigma dip. Anyway, what we wrote in PRL was six, greater than 6 SIX sigma, because we wanted them to know that this was just so incredibly improbable, it was not a fluctuation. Could be a screw up, but it's not a fluctuation. And PRL said, no, 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 PRL rules say you're not allowed to spell SIX. We even tried to sneak it back in in the proofs, but they were onto us. But at some point, you get something which is so significant that it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to start talking about whether this is 6 sigma or 7 sigma or 14 sigma or 11 sigma. If this is a mistake, it's because we did something wrong, not because the background happened to fl float up in three channels. It was also surprising that we're making as many of these guys as we are. And nobody seems to really have a good idea why that is. So. Those of you who are looking for another project, you might try and e explain this. LHCB sees the same thing at a much lower rate. Another fact to explain. So that's the simplest of all possible analyses that we did and we published. Notice the word Monte Carlo never crossed my lips. What is Monte Carlo going to tell us? Right. It would only be helpful if it could give us an absolute prediction of the backgrounds. Otherwise. We can just count it ourselves. 
And in fact, that's what we did. So any questions before I move on to something else? Yes, Tom. Right, so Tom, uh, Tom DeGrand asked, why is there no previous sighting from the B factory? We have to go back here. So the problem is, if you were to see this, B factories can produce things with quantum numbers the same as the photon, one minus minus. The 4S is above BB bar threshold. So if you make a 4S, it immediately falls apart to a BB bar. Mass of the B is 5280, same as feet in a mile. It would immediately fall apart to a BB bar. And the odds of it making a radio transition are essentially zero. So that's, that's the problem there. So you have the same problem with the 5S. You have the, there is probably also a state here for the charmonium. You've got the exact same problem seeing it. If you want to have a radio transition above it, it's just going to fall apart to a pair of D mesons. Uh, the statement is presumably we're making the P states directly. And the answer is presumably. We have no actual evidence, one way or the other. This is, yeah, that paper, paper one. Uh, pa paper one was kind of fun. It was, uh, paper one, we also made the sort of a mistake that experimenters make all the time, but we almost sent it to the journal. So we do systematic checks, right, which is basically you change one's thing, and none of them had a big effect. Well, it turned out that that was the one that we sent to the journal. And the only reason, well, you've got two most, almost identical plots. And the only reason we, we caught it was this guy here. And the grad student knew that in the regular, in the one we sent had them reversed. And he knew the plot bin by bin well enough to realize that we didn't quite have the right one in the paper. Yes, Ian. So the question is, how long did it take before the professor believed the graduate student? The professor got the experiment involved almost immediately. Uh, it was right after uh, I became uh, stepped down as physics coordinator. I was in charge of reviewing that paper. And it took us less than a week to verify that everything was, was correct. I mean, one of the, it is difficult to imagine how you could screw this up and get them all the way. The one way you can imagine doing this is that you're misreconstructing some other particle. And because it's the same particle you're misreconstructing, you misreconstruct it the same way. So that's what we were, we were really focusing on and how this could possibly be a screw up. The other thing that we didn't put in the paper but we checked ourselves is that the yield, the relative yield of, of this and this matched. Because if I am producing a certain number of particles, that number is whatever it is, irrespective of how it decays and how, how, how the decay then acts with the detector. So if we understood what was going on, those numbers should match, and in fact they did. So not only this one, but also these. I mean, the real question is, does this match any worse than the other two that you knew were there? All right, so we, we had an idea of, of what we had to do. Any more questions on this? Is that a question or? Yes. OK, so we, we are at. At a, at a crossing point, as the famous Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So I can continue in this blackboardy presentation if you think you're happy. Also, as you might imagine, I've got like 10,000 Higgs discovery talks left over from 2012. I can go through one of those, which would all be slides. My personal preference is to stick with the blackboard, but if, if people are saying this isn't working for them, I'm happy to switch. So stay, go. OK. So let's start with the Higgs. I'm not going to show you a single Mexican hat. I was the first person to make this plot. People like this plot, which shows what the Higgs decays into. But I think this plot is much more useful. As, as pointed out, most of the time the Higgs decays to BB bar, which is absolutely useless. Right. There's something on the order of 10,000 times as many BB bars produced from non-Higgs processes around the Higgs mass. So we'd have to sit there for a long time to see any sort of excess. CC bar is worse. Glue glue 
which is actually quite large. You know, it's like, you know, the LHC, I mean, it's a big box of gluons. None of these are very good. ZZ, WW, and two photons. ZZ and WW look pretty good now, but I haven't put branching fractions into it, right? What does the W do most of the time? Jets. What does the Z do most of the time? Jets. If, if the Z isn't happy to, you know, to decay in jets and screw you up, it's happy to go into neutrinos and screw you up. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, don't particularly like Zs. They're not, they're not proper things. Uh, two photon, it's uh, uh, two tenths of a percent, but it turns out that's actually the, the best channel that we've got. <laughs> because everything else here, the other 99% is terrible. We're also very lucky, because you can see the two photons maximizes roughly where we see it. If we wanted to, ha you know, if the Higgs were sitting at 140 or 160, our job is going to be much harder with two photons. And the way to see this isn't so much that thinking about the two photons, the point is not what this little sliver is doing, it's what the competition is doing is that as the Higgs gets heavier, it's decaying more and more into WW star and ZZ star, and that's and eventually TT bar, and that's sucking the partial width out of the two photons. So that's why it's, it's going that way. So we're going to design the analysis out of gamma gamma, ZZ star, and WW star. That's what we did. So let's, go to the, let's start with ZZ star. I talked to you about muons, and I said all we really need to do is to see for the chi analysis that a particle went through a pile of steel and hit something on the other end. Atlas has spent hundreds of millions of Swiss francs to build a more complicated detector, because the complicated detectors are the good detectors. You see there's three stations here, and the whole thing is sitting inside toroidal magnets. So the coils are going in and out of the page, so the field goes this way, or possibly that way. I'm 50% I'm sure the field goes this way. Right? And that bends the particles front and back rather than in the solenoid, which bends them side by side. These are ginormous magnets. The energy stored in the magnet is about a gigajoule, 1.2 gigajoules there. That's about what the energy in a lightning bolt is. A megajoule is about a stick of dynamite. So we have a huge amount of stored energy here. We want to be very careful about putting energy in and taking energy out. And in fact, this coil, this coil, this coil, and this coil, the four and across, there's eight coils there, can, are all powered together, as are its partners in the other x direction. And the reason for that is if we lose the current in a magnet, we don't want there to be a torque on it. Because if you put a gigajoule of stored energy and told it, please rotate this device, it would. <laughs> right? And just as there's, you know, there's, there's angular momentum stored in a magnetic field, so it's perfectly happy to do this. So that's the design of the muon spectrometer. And here, again, we are measuring by tracking. So we're using the same technique we talked about here, only on a much, much larger scale. This is what it looks like in real life. These are the so-called small wheels. There's a person for size. And those are the big wheels, which are larger than the small wheels. So the big wheels sit around here. So these things are not, are not small devices. CMS has a more sensible, I'm sorry, experiment C has a more sensible way of doing things. They use the return field of their magnets to measure the muon momentum. So this is all iron. The magnetic field is a solenoid, so it's going into the board. And what happens is it goes into the board, and then it returns to go out of the board, because magnetic field lines neither begin nor end. So I have field going in the board here and out of the board here. If I have a muon, it will bend in one direction here, and then it will bend in the other direction there. And if there's no energy loss, this angle is the same as that angle because I've rotated it to the left, and then I've rotated it to the right. It's displaced, but the angle is the same. So you can tell how much energy loss you've had in there. And if you have a soft muon, a lot of energy loss makes some sense. Maybe it's real. If you have what you think is a very energetic muon that's undergone a lot of energy loss, that doesn't sound like it makes a whole lot of sense either. So there's four planes here. CMS was so happy with this design, they put it in their logo. And you can see how muons behave. So the most energetic ones don't bend very much. The least energetic ones bend a lot and eventually range out. And intermediate ones do intermediate things. So that's what they built. 
Uh, let's, are there any more questions about muons before I go on to calorimetry? So I used to do muons for a living. The trick is not designing a muon system. The trick is designing a muon system that you can afford. Right. So you've got, you can see acres, literally acres of detector that you've got to put in there. And the real trick is to make this all, all work there. Atlas also has a problem, since we have a little time. How do you align these guys? So to measure, say, if you have a 1 TV muon, you want to measure that to say 10%. That's you know, any, if you want to look at it for a Z prime up, the, you know, a 2 TV Z prime, it'll give you two 1, one TV muons. You want something on the order of 10% resolution to, to tell that you've got that and not some other spot. That means you need something like 100 micron resolution on your Sagitta. All right, now, I told you this thing is 25 meters tall. What's the thermal expansion coefficient of everything? 10 to the minus 5. It's probably 1 in, in, in theory units. In, in Halliday and Resnick units, everything has a coefficient of thermal expansion around 10 to the minus 5. So that tells you you have to have better than one degree of tolerance along five meters, you know, basically a soccer stadium that's five stories tall, hold the whole thing to within about a degree. How do you do that? You don't. <laughs> that's completely impossible. Nobody knows how to build a HVA system that's that good. So instead, you have to realize that the detector is continually expanding and contracting. So Atlas has to measure where everything is at all times. So periodically, we go through and we use lasers to see how much things have drifted. And then once in a while, we'll do an actual calibration run with the magnets off to make sure that we know where everything started with. There's another problem with magnet off calibration. When you turn the magnet on, everything moves. So you have to be able to go from measuring where things are to where you want things to be. OK, so let's go back to. Hadron calorimeters. So I talked about calorimetry here in the way of thinking about for electromagnetic calorimeters. What happens if instead of having a photon or an electron go through, you can see an electron does the same thing. Suppose I put a proton in or a pi on, what would happen? So someone said stuff. Stuff happens, yes. <laughs> if I put a pi on through, what kind of stuff will happen? I've, made a, I've got a detector made out of nuclei. What's going to happen when I throw a pion into one? I'll get more pions, right? I might break the nucleus up. I might have more pions come through. I might make a kaon or two just to make things interesting. So the same sort of thing happens in my box, but it goes, in general, more, more deeply because electromagnetic interactions see the electron, which is big. The pion sees the nucleus, which is small. So even though alpha is larger, it's got to get closer. And you know, maybe I've knocked off a proton. Maybe this makes a lambda. Right? And a couple things you notice. One is there are fewer particles. That's just because the mass of the electron is small and the mass of the pion is big relative to each other. So I can't make as many of them. And that means I have more fluctuations. So I have the same basic principle that I'm going to ultimately look at ionization in, in a device. But I've got the problem of I've got smaller number of particles. I've got larger fluctuations. So you can think of EM showers as like McDonald's restaurants. Every one of them is the same. You've seen one. You've seen them all. Hadronic showers are more like snowflakes. Everyone is unique. We're all special. I love all of my hadronic showers equally. Those, those are the differences. So what does CMS do? I'm sorry. Experiment C, what does experiment C do? They use scintillating tile-based sampling calorimeters. So like Atlas used with the EM, CMS uses for the hydronic. It's brass. You can't really see that here. Uh, but if you look at the, you know, that, that kind of brass color is because you're looking at the face there. Uh, Atlas uses seal, steel. Uh, I'll, we can talk about why they, they made that decision. CMS's calorimeter is quite thin. That's because it's sitting inside the magnetic field. Gee whiz fact, the cost of a magnet is, goes as the stored energy of that magnet. So if I double the size of the magnet, right, stored energy goes as B squared, 
Uh, so if, and keep the field the same. Uh, I doubled it. It's going to go out eight times the stored energy. If I want to increase the field, CMS's field is stronger than Atlas's by a factor of two. That also goes up. So they want to have, since their calorimeter sits inside their magnet, they want to make it as small as possible because they don't want to spend any more for the magnet than they have to. So that's what CMS's looks like. Atlas, as I said, uses these tiles. This is all steel. Those are the scintillating tiles. So the steel is where the interaction takes place. The sampling is done in the, uh, in the scintillator tiles. These are all mapped to a phototube in a very complicated way so that it's projective to the interaction point. So this is connected to that, which is connected to that, which is connected to that. There is not a single missed cabling in the entire experiment. I'm, I was impressed by that. Then I found out that they cheated. <laughs> so what they did is before they put the phototube on, they stuck a flashlight on the end of it, and you could see what lit up over there, and you could check to see if it was right or wrong. So they did, in fact, exactly the backwards thing, and, and it worked out perfectly. That's what one of these things looks like. I have, I have these on my desk. They're really kind of fun to stick out in the sunlight because it shifts the UV down to, to blue where you can see it. So it's kind of glow in the light rather than glow in the dark. So, but the basic idea here is exactly as it was in the calorimeter. The particle deposits energy here through ionization, which excites the scintillator, which gives you light. We then shift it down to these fibers and measure it in photomultiplier tubes. That's what it looks like in real life. You can see the decks there, so it's about the size of a nice, a, a quite nice house. I mean, my house would like me to that. But, you know, not quite a mansion, but, you know, something that the neighbors would ooh and ah. So it's quite large. This is the EM calorimeter, which it sits inside of it. The trick to the whole thing was getting that one in place. You build from the bottom to the top. And you have to have everything in the right place so that you have exactly enough space to slip the last guy in. It's shimmed with dimes. Okay, that's how the Hadron calorimeter works, but we're really more interested in jets. So let's talk just a bit about jets. I guess we're, we're sick of corconium by now. Oh, I can even leave that up. So Matt, Matt Schwartz talked about jets. I assume that's my view of a jet. And you've got a big pile of particles here. When we started the LHC, people said, how on earth are you ever going to calibrate this? Because you're not going to get a 70 EV test beam, but you might get 70 EV jets. And the answer is you don't have to. Because this shows what the, the jet energy is carried by Let's say, in this case, a 200 MeV jet, half of it is carried by particles under 20 GeV. All right. Above this line are photons, and above this, below this line are hadrons. This is roughly uh, 2 thirds, 1 third. Anyone want to venture a guess why it's 2 thirds, 1 third? Someone said charge. I was going to say Klebsch Gordon coefficients, but hey, we can, we, we'll, go with, we'll go with charge. Isospin is telling you that you're producing. Uh, as many pi zeros as you are pi pluses and pi minuses. So you expect a third of the energy in pi zeros and two thirds in pi plus, pi minus. It's not quite the same because you've got kaons and other things, but it, it's close. So you can see that you only get to very energetic hadrons, and even very energetic is a few hundred GeV, way out here. All right, so you know, you, even at a TeV, it's only a couple of percent of the energy is carried that way. So it's relatively easy to bootstrap your way from a test beam measurement, which covers all the way down here, to getting that last little piece here. And the way you get that last little piece is by looking at jet balances. So suppose I have a TeV jet balanced against two 500 GeV jets. I know what the 500 GeV jets are because those are calibrated. right? And if I see the one TeV that balances that systematically high or low, I know that I have some sort of problem in my calibration. Uh, let me also talk a little bit more about this calibration. I think I don't have a slide here. That's right. So as I mentioned, the resolution is worse. And the resolution is worse for a couple of reasons. So suppose it's, it's worse in general because I have fewer particles. But suppose I got lucky or unlucky. Suppose I got lucky and I had a bunch of pi zeros here. It just happened to be that I produced pi zeros when I hit the nucleus. 
what's going to happen? I'm going to have a lot of particles. I'm going to have good resolution. Right? And it's going to be at what we call the EM scale. It's going to look at exactly as it did if it were an electron. Suppose it's the other way. Suppose it's all pi pluses and pi minuses. Right? Now that's bad news. I'm not producing many, many tracks. And it's not at the EM scale. So this is what's called compensation. You would like, ideally, a detector that if I put in 100 GeV pi on or 100 GeV electron, I got exactly the same response out. Because then I would be insensitive to how that jet interact fragmented and how that interacted with the calorimeter. People can build them. D0 built them. It is a big waste of time. The pro it's very expensive. So if I want them to be the same, I have to increase the hadronic response. Right? If I have hydrogen, I have much more quarks per unit mass than if I have lead. Yes? No? Well, maybe much is two more. I have more quarks in per electron for hydrogen than I have for lead because I have one electron per proton, but I get piles of neutrons. So that means I want to go, if I want a compensating calorimeter, I want to go to a very low Z material, like paraffin. You'd like to build this entire calorimeter out of wax. This has problems. Remember I said to save money on your magnet, you want to make it small? If you build it out of wax, it's not going to be very small. It's going to be enormous. Wax is not the best structural material in the world, <laughs> uh, particularly if it gets warm. So most experiments, and both LHC experiments said, we're going to bite the bullets and figure out the compensation offline. And you can do that offline because, for example, if I can see the depth development, I have an idea of do I have a large number of particles or a small number of particles. If the energy is located in one spot, I probably had a bunch of pi zeros there, and they stopped in that range. If it's spread out all over the detector, it's probably mostly pi pluses and pi minuses. So we can the experiments start from this and they can work out what the jet resolution is fairly accurately and we've made some design compromises to build the detector but at the end of the day we we have the detector so let's talk a little bit about the experiments design i'll have you out of here by 315 don't worry so cms as i said it's a a compact design and by compact i mean you can actually see the stick people there uh, like everything else, it's tracking, calorimetry, and muons. This sits inside their magnet, and the return field is there. So in this case, the solenoid has field in this direction, loops back here. All right. Atlas is flapping in the breeze. Got we, we call it air, uh, air core toroids because there's air in this gap. Uh, cable core toroids might be a better description of what's there because it's really filled with, with Cables taking signal out, tracking, calorimetry, and then muons. So let's talk a little bit about which is the better experiment. So experiment A is bigger. It has a big tracking core. Experiment C is smaller and has a smaller tracking core. B is four Tesla, sort of. There's a story there, but that's, there's a beer story here. Atlas is two Tesla and twice as far. So which experiment would have the better tracking? A. You would think A. In fact, C has the better tracking. And that's because I lied to you. When I worked out the BL squared, I said all other things being equal, or should have. CMS has slightly better measurements at every point because it's all silicon. Remember I said Atlas went to, to gas on the outside? That turns out to give you a measurement which is five, ten times worse. So the fact that there's all this stuff going out here, which isn't giving you much additional information in the measurement, means that effectively it's the same as having a smaller tracker. 
on the calorimetry side, which one do you think has the better calorimeter? C. Why? Right, but the calorimeter isn't, isn't, isn't looking at silicon. So A has the better calorimeter because they invested more space in it. They can see the depth development. Right, certainly the better Hadron calorimeter. The EM calorimeter is kind of a wash, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So now, suppose you're designing a detector for, let me put in, and that's like a Tevatron experiment. Right, so it's in general much smaller. So suppose you're designing a detector for the nematron. You have a choice to make. Right? You can either say, I want my tracker to be this great big monstrosity. Because remember, tracking is getting harder and harder as it goes up. So this would be something with BL squared roughly seven times what it is today. Or you could say, screw it. I'm not going to be messing with tracking at all. And instead, I'm going to put all that money that would have gone into the tracker into the calorimeter. The technical term for this is the iron ball. <laughs> the thought is that really what you've, you're doing is you're stopping most non-muons, and you've got a very good picture of the muons on the outside. This was an SSC idea that came around. So this is one of the things the experiments that will ultimately be thinking about a 100 TV collider have to decide. What is the relative balance between tracking and calorimetry, particularly given that tracking is getting harder and harder and calorimetry is getting easier and easier? The other thing I wanted to point out with jets is the way experiment C and experiment A do it is totally different. Experiment A looks at the total measures the jet by measuring the energy in the calorimeter and saying that's the energy of the jet. Experiment C does something called particle flow. And particle flow, this, I apologize to people in the wrong end of the room, says I've got a jet here. And say I've got energy in the calorimeter here, and maybe I've got energy in the calorimeter here, and nothing over here, and energy there and there. So what you would do in particle flow is you'd say, OK, it's Atlas would say, let's just add up this energy, and that's our jet energy. CMS would say, since tracking works better than the calorimeter, I'm going to erase that and just use the tra this track energy. Here, I'll do the same thing. Here, this is a track that I don't see in the calorimeter. I'll add that. And these guys are probably neutrons or pi zeros or something that was neutral. And they would add them up that way. There are intense fights at conferences about which is the right approach. All right, which is the right approach? Exactly. So the answer was, doesn't it depend on which is more accurate? The reason CMS likes this is they have a relatively stronger tracker and a relatively weaker calorimeter. So they want to use as much tracking information as they can to measure a jet, whereas Atlas has the opposite situation. We have a relatively stronger calorimeter and a relatively weaker tracker. So experiment A says we'd really rather rely on the calorimeter. So the statement is, there are charged particles in the jets, and you're bending them. And the answer is, yes, you are. That is an issue. Uh, it's, not, it's more of an issue from CMS because they have a stronger field. But it turns out it's not that much of an issue, because how big is a jet? Typically, the radius is some number like 0.4. And you have to be you know, of only a few GeV, and you're always bending inside that 0.4 cone. So there is energy that is swept out of a jet. There's also energy swept into a jet. Right, both of these things happen. But it tends not to be a lot of energy. And particularly when you're looking at jets at 100 or 200 or 300, it's a few percent that's leaking in or leaking out. That's not the bigger problem. The bigger problem is just that the detectors themselves have certain weaknesses. You know, what we really want is to devise a detector that measures the quark energy that produced all of this. Right, and, that, and we don't have that. So the question is, do these cause differences in MET smearing, which means that it's time for me to talk about MET. <laughs> I must go faster. So this is missing transverse energy. So this is a, I guess this is a D0. Yeah, it's D0. Uh, so that's a D0 event display of a W. 
Uh, I picked that because it's nice and clean. If you look at an LHC one, it's, it's just filled with stuff. And what you have is an electron over here and nothing on the other side of it. So this is called missing ET, sometimes called ET miss, sometimes called met. And it means that one or more missing things went through it. Most people think, ah, that means I've, I've seen a neutrino. But I don't actually know that I've seen a neutrino. There might be three neutrinos out there. There might be two, there might be four. This is an issue when you start doing supersymmetry searches because you might have two LSPs going out. So this is something you have to understand. So the other thing I wanted to show you is something called a Lego plot. This is just a 2D histogram of measured energy. So in this case, this is from UA1. That is an electron. This is a Nobel Prize winning plot. This is one of the first Ws that's seen. And you can see all that energy in a tower. In this plot, a jet is something fuzzier. So that's what missing ET is. So your question is, does this depend on missing ET resolution? Or does missing ET resolution depend on this? The answer is yes. And it's maybe worth thinking about resolution. Right. Is there anything better than resolution? You know, you can't be thin enough or rich enough or have enough money. Can you, you know, what about resolution? Shouldn't we all try to get the best possible resolution that we can? Yes? Anyone disagree? All right, so let me give you two pictures of the jet resolution. So let's imagine I have jets of a known energy. God tells me their energy, and I go out and measure it. So this tells me how good the detector is. Which would you rather have, that? Or that? The second one? The second one is narrower, but it's also got a tail. Right? So I am mismeasuring a certain fraction of them badly. And if that isn't scary enough, suppose the tail goes in the other direction. Now, when I'm looking for unusual events, events with a lot of energy, or a lot, right, I now know that some fraction of the time, when I thought I had a TEV jet, I only had a 200 GeV jet that somehow faked a TEV jet. So resolution is not everything. And Kyle may have mentioned this, but there is a theorem that says the estimator that has the smallest resolution, the best resolution, is never unbiased. You can always improve the resolution by introducing a bias. So really, we have to make, again, a judgment. How much of tails are we willing to accept for improving the resolution? How much bias are we willing to accept to improve the resolution? And uh, this is part of the art of being an experimenter, because there is no scientific answer. Right? Maybe, uh, maybe analysis by analysis there is, but in general, there, there really isn't. So you have to think about, when you're doing these things, designing your detector, designing how you're going to calibrate it, and so on, you have to decide what is important to you. And resolution is important, but it's not the only thing. Let's go back to being too rich. Right? If, you're li if you got a billion dollars tomorrow, your life would change. If you got $2 billion tomorrow, would your life change any more? So that's one of the issues about resolution, right? You know, if I can make it slightly better but induce very large biases, I probably won't. If I can make it a lot better and induce relatively small biases, I probably will. Same with missing energy. Yes? Oh, oh why, why, why do these have weird tails? Because basically what I'm doing, is, I, think, well, I, mean, I think this is a good spot to stop and just take questions for the last five minutes. So the tails come because I'm adding cells with various weights. And those weights are not a function of anything. It's something that we've put together as, a, as our best guess of how to go from many different measurements to this single value. And fluctuations within the various categories that I'm weighting are then added more or less depending on those weights. So those weights are what's putting in these possible tails. Does that make any sense at all, or am I just babbling? I am prone to babbling. Yes, no? So what, what you're really doing is you're saying the energy I have is the sum of the measured energies in various parts of the detector with some weight. 
right? And these weights are invented by people, right? So various fluctuations in how the energy is distributed among the various things that I can measure will, be, will interact differently with those weights invented by people. So if you ask, where does this nonlinearity come in? It comes in from our brains. It's, we've put this in to try and get the best compromise between energy resolution and not claiming discovery when there's nothing there, because that would be embarrassing. Well, some people find that embarrassing. Some people find that more embarrassing than others. So the question is, does this, does, does this assume fixed hardware? And the answer is, once we've built the detector, absolutely. But before we build the detector, people start saying things like, asking questions like, if I built it out of brass and not out of iron, how would that change things? Right? Because if I, all other things being equal, I put brass in, it's going to make the compensation worse. But it's going to make the experiment denser, so I might be able to make another layer of measurements out of it for example. So these are the sorts of things you might think about. You could also think, you know, if I put something denser in, I might be able to put an extra, you know, I could put in thicker scintillator rather than thinner scintillator because I've got the same number of nuclei ahead of it. So the reason that people, uh, CMS used brass is brass has a density of about nine and iron has a density of about seven. So you can get nine sevenths as much material in their detector as you can there. So since they were pushing down to something very small. Now, they could have used uranium or lead or something and gotten even smaller still. Brass turns out to be about the densest material that you can buy that's cheap to work with. Right? You know, people, you know, there's millennia of how to deal with brass. You know, that experience, you can just get it. Whereas if you need uranium cut, you need to talk to special uranium cutters. Uranium's a mess to work with. It's, it's Carcinogenic, it's mutagenic, it catches fire when you mill it. It's, it's just no fun to work with. So, so why is the energy the sum of the energy? So, so if I have a predominantly hadronic shower, because of this compensation effect, I'm actually underestimating the energy. So I want to add that up. If I look at the depth development of the shower, right? So that, that's, re that's another reason. But the best reason of all is that I say we're measuring energy, but I'm lying to you again. What I really mean here are ADC counts. Right? There's some piece of electronics over here which is giving me a number which I might claim is GEV or something, but actually is just what some meter, meter somewhere is reading. So I have to, th there will always be some W's to get from that to energy. And, you know, once you, you know, once you're down that path, you know, we've already established that. We're now just discussing the price. You, we've set up how this whole thing is, is working and we're kind of stuck with that machinery. Any more questions? I'm supposed, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be positive. That was a good question. <laughs> yes, I, I at work, they made me take one of these psychology profiles, and it said I was not a people person. <laughs> I, have, I, have no, I have no problems with people. It's idiots I can't work with. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, so here's where we're going to be tomorrow. So I've now explained how all of the pieces work to get a Higgs discovery. So tomorrow, I will walk you through the Higgs discovery. We will probably finish a little early on the third day, so think about things you might want me to talk about, and we can talk about that tomorrow, and I can stick something in. <laughs> I'm sorry, you have to go to the fiction department. They're, they're down the hall. <laughs> okay, thank you.